All right, well, hi, everybody, and thank you so much for spending this lovely Friday night with us. Um, tonight's reverse Q&A is hosted by the Free Thinkers of PSU, which is a student group that's dedicated to the promotion of freedom of inquiry and student expression. And since its inception, Free Thinkers has been committed to challenging dogma through creating a space for students to test their own ideas and question ideologies in a group of their peers. Um, and tonight, we're really excited to provide a space for students to share their experiences with social justice at PSU. So if you're interested in joining our student group by going to our weekly discussions or just uh, joining our email list, come up to anybody in a black Freethinker sweatshirt and we'd be happy to welcome you and meet you. Um, so before I get into it, I just have um, an official statement that I was given from um, the student group organization. Um, so this event was scheduled and organized by the Freethinkers of PSU. We expect all attendees to conduct themselves in such a way that the program is not disrupted. If an attendee behaves in such a way that prevents audience members from hearing, seeing, or participating in the scheduled event, they may be asked to stop or leave the event. A disruption is conduct that interferes with the speaker or artist's ability to conduct the scheduled event or interference that blocks the audience from seeing, hearing, or participating in the event. Silent displays of protest, expression during a question and answer, or usual reactions commonly displayed by an audience during heated discussion are not considered disruption. Um, so tonight's event is uh, co-hosted by um, a faculty member um, known by the name of Dr. Peter Bogosian, or as we call him, the Bogosian Explosion. <laughs> he is a full-time faculty member of PSU's Department of Philosophy, and he has a long history of being an outstanding advocate to free-thinking students. And this evening, he will be joining us, the free thinkers, and listen, in listening to student experiences in hopes of gaining a more informed understanding of how social justice teachings have impacted students at PSU. So without any further ado, I want to welcome Dr. Peter Bogosian. Thank you, everybody, for coming. We appreciate it. We know that the uh, circumstances surrounding everybody coming out tonight might have been a little tricky, so thank you for being here. So first, just to re-remind you that the event is being filmed, so if you're uncomfortable being on film, this is definitely not the room to be in. Uh, second, the filmmaker here tonight, uh, he's injured his back, his name is Travis. He's making a documentary called When in Doubt. Um, it's a film about the importance of having difficult conversations and how we can improve our relationships across ideological divides. So they're looking for people to be in the film. Um, if you're struggling with a friendship and want to be in the film, you can check out a little bit more about what it's about. Whenindoubtfilm.com to sign up. Whenindoubtfilm.com if you want to learn more about that. Okay, cool. So here's what we'll do tonight. I'm going to keep this very short and very sweet. Um, it's a reverse Q&A, so you're the experts, and you're going to speak to us about your experience, and I'm going to listen, and we're going to take the total number of people who want to talk, and then we're going to divide, depending on how many people it is, a number of minutes so that we give, you, you'd come on up and you'd talk about your experiences. And then, depending on how many people talk, we'll just open it up to general Q&A, and um, here are the rules for speaking. It's pretty simple. You have to be a student, either um, grad student or undergrad student at this university. You cannot be a past student. You cannot be a faculty member. So if you're a student, either undergraduate or graduate, even if you're only taking one class, you're still welcome to come up. Um, and then second, all, second uh, please don't interrupt anybody uh, when they're speaking. And we really do want to fit as many people in as we can. And I think we have the room for an hour and a half. So OK, so without further ado, I'm going to sit down and listen. Um, we had eight folks scheduled to to speak. Uh, who who would like to who would like to speak? Period. <laughs> this is going to make for a short evening. Um, <laughs> so if you're afraid of speaking out and or you're fearful or what have you, we can blur your face so you have absolutely nothing to worry about. So if that's an issue, uh, and can I have a, an assurance on the filmmaker that you can indeed do that? Okay, cool. So uh, you don't have you don't have to to, to worry about um, people holding you hostage or being upset with you. 
Again, this is going to be a very short evening. If nobody, if nobody comes up to talk, anybody want to share their social justice experiences? Yeah. Okay. Cool. <laughs> you don't have to go first. Does anybody want to go first? Okay. All right. Thank you. My name is Julia. Um, I resent the Me Too movement. I resent the idea that women can find empowerment through solidarity and victimhood, that identity is victimhood. I resent the notion that the only thing women can have with each other is past experiences. And I don't believe that past experiences provide a useful present or a present that can turn into a future. And I think that this idea of empowerment through past experiences is what really brings women back in time to the 1950s. Thank you. So I'm a veteran, so I have the GI Bill. I'm not really worried about tuition. But two years ago, there was a, a student uh, meeting in which they were discussing, a student faculty meeting in which they were discussing the tuition race. Uh, and students were to air their concerns. I went because, well, I am concerned about tuition raising, even if it doesn't affect me. There's still a problem in America that tuition is not cheap. While I was there, I was expecting people to air their concerns about things such as why is the president getting paid 700,000 a year plus benefits. But no, this entire thing turned into an emotional plea for I can't pay for school this next term. And no real, uh, no, we didn't get anywhere with the entire discussion, and I left halfway through. One at a time, please. Not, not, not all at once. And again, we really can blow you off if you're uh, concerned. Do you have any provocative questions or anything? Well, I'm hoping before we do any, I'm hoping that we can just have people. I don't want to color it one way. You know, yeah. just like if there's, I'm sure there's somebody here who thinks that the social justice is wonderful. I'd love to hear you if that's the case. Uh, I mean, it really is. Just let it out. So, and I'm cool just sitting here for a few minutes until someone goes. And if that's not the case, then we'll just open the whole thing up. All right. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to be very brief as well. I know several uh, grad student assistants who work uh, within classrooms and have to do a lot of grading in addition to their grad studies. And they get paid for about 20 hours of work, but they have to do an extra 20 and end up doing close to 40 and 60 hours of work total. But they're only paid for 20. And this seems like a form of wage theft to me. So I don't know if anything I feel something should be done about this, but I don't know if anything is. And they don't want to be listed as part-time, so yeah, that's all I have to say. I started working in Alaska in the fishing industry before I came to PSU. And once I started my education here, I got a lot of the racist and misogynistic and the whole spiel of subtext. And it was blatant as well. And I don't know if it's cognitive dissonance, but every time, and I still work in Alaska now, I'm a commercial fisherman, and I work with genuine 
racist and genuine homophobic people. However, the commonalities of work up there, I didn't see anything. I didn't see any of this bigotry or hatred. You know, someone might have had that view, but at the end of the day, you're working 20 hours, same boat, same cannery, doesn't matter. And you end up bonding with this person, and it's not anything more than something trivial at the end of the day. And you maintain those bonds. And so coming here after every season and being told to the, the object of the assignment or the essay was to write to find a certain point, and I would write to find that point and do it to get the grade, but I just knew it was wrong. I, and I had to continue to do it for the grade because I'm paying my own way through education, and I don't want to waste my time here. But to do it so blatantly and to know it's wrong, and it's just anecdotal experience, but it has been in the extreme where, you know, soul to soul, I've seen people break and seen people become friends. I just don't know what to do after this education, which has, at the end of the day, not been satisfactory and not helped me grow to what I thought I could achieve in college. So. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'd like to share my experience, and I hope that all of you guys take it as a bit of a warning for the way that social justice is going to impact us down the line. Uh, I'm studying mathematics in college, and one day I hope to be a teacher. And so part of my study means that I'm studying a lot of courses on how to teach. In my courses on how to teach mathematics, which is not a social study, we are being indoctrinated to believe that all mathematics teaching must be taught through a social justice lens. I've had classes where we're supposed to be, you know, learning very simple topics to teach children, and we're being told that rather than focusing on those topics when you teach children, you have to focus on social inequality, social injustice. We did a project where we were supposed to design a park and talk about geometric figures, which could be used, blah, 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 blah. We spent a major period of that time talking about why it's very important that you encourage kids to put gender neutral bathrooms in that park. If you're in a fifth grade classroom and you're going to waste a major portion of the time that's supposed to be dedicated to mathematics education trying to teach about wage inequality, gender neutral bathrooms, that sort of thing, which may be good or may be bad, you will be missing out on the content which is meant to be learned, the content which made your parents wealthy enough to put you through college. Your grandchildren and your children will suffer under the system which is currently being built around you, which has not only taken over writing and social studies in you know, elementary education, but is rapidly taking over math, science, and every other aspect of education. I'm just like the previous speaker. I put my head down, I do the work, I do everything that I'm told to do. I'm not gonna waste my time, I'm not gonna waste my money, I'm not gonna fail a class over it, but I am scared for what it means for all the teachers who are going into these programs saying, well, I'm just gonna teach what I was taught to teach, and they're going to waste your children's time and education, and they will come out less competitive than other children. Thank you. So I'm a transfer student here, and I moved here from Canada, and the first thing I tried doing was making friends, because this is a new city, this is a new campus for me. Uh, so I tried to do it through um, student groups, and I joined a group called the Feminist of Color Collective, and at first I thought it was fine, like a social thing where you just hang out, make friends that, I don't know, like-minded maybe, um, 
But the more I went to the meetings, the more I realized that their whole identity is, or individuality, there's no individuality there. And um, at first we would just go around uh, every meeting and say our names, say our pronouns, which I'm fine with. But the more meetings I attended, the more things have changed and they started asking us to say our ethnicities too, for some reason. And I thought that was weird, but I went anyways. Um, but then I, I felt like there was nothing productive coming out of it. Like the more, the more meetings I went to, the more I realized all they want to talk about is um, how much they hate everything <laughs> and how much um, everything is to blame others for and that, um, I don't know, that it's all about victimhood there and it was just a lot of negative energy and I felt like I wasn't making any friends anyway so I stopped going and it wasn't, um, it wasn't something I was getting anything out of and I didn't make any friends <laughs> but I stopped going <laughs> and yeah, <laughs> thanks. Um, previous speaker uh, talked about the Feminists of Color Collective, and that's really interesting because I, although I've never uh, attended any of their meetings, I did see some of their posters around the campus advertising that people could come and join. And I saw these posters, and at the bottom of the poster, it said that it was solely for people of color. And I thought, that's rather discriminatory. That's uh, uh, rather racist. So I uh, take, took a look at first on my phone uh, that uh, there's a little anti-discrimination bias student code of conduct at PSU. So I thought maybe this violates some student code of conduct at PSU. So I took a look at that. It did. It had a dis definition of what's discrimination uh, that really seemed to fit with what we thought discrimination was. Uh, and so I thought, okay, this is in violation perhaps of that. So I went to the um, student of, or the Global Office of uh, Equity and Compliance, I think it's what it's called. And I went there and they told me that they'd uh, only look into it if I did an online complaint, which I did. And uh, a few weeks went by after the online complaint, no response. I went to the student uh, office, uh, I think the Dean of Student Life took a look at it. They didn't, uh, uh, they told me actually quite explicitly there that the discrimination uh, based on race that the Feminists of Color Collective was doing was perfectly fine. So I took this actually to Peter Bogosian. He tweeted out a photo of the uh, poster and that kind of got a response, uh, uh, some response. And uh, now I'm actually, uh, I, I, I took the, this, this thing that I had and took it to the Oregon Civil Rights Division. And uh, I called them up a few days ago to see what was going on and they're still looking at it. So I'm awaiting a response from them to see maybe if it's in violation of some law, I don't know. Um, but if anyone has any other experiences with the Feminist Color Collective, I'd love to hear. Um, I just know that discrimination based on race is something that I'd rather not see uh, on any campus, anywhere. Uh, that's all. So what I find to be very interesting is that no one has come up here and attempted to say anything incredibly like assertive in an attempt to like rally people 
against this, whatever it is we are defining as social justice. And I think it's a very good thing. I think uh, to what your point was, and to what your point was about just uh, putting your nose to the grindstone, just writing it out to get a degree, I think that's the best strategy we can have in the long run if we want to beat whatever it is that we all agree is unproductive for a good education environment. Um, I think the best thing we can do, and it's something I have a lot of respect for the free thinkers, is build you know, mutual relationships based on the things that we think are important and not really overtly engage with a lot of it because it's almost giving it too much credit and taking it seriously when much of it doesn't really merit being taken too seriously, in my personal opinion. Because in the end, all of what's going on here is propped up by trillions of dollars of unfunded liabilities, and it's all going to collapse at some point. And all we're going to have is what we actually learned here. And I think the free thinkers' environment and the leaders have done a great job creating a, an environment here where we can have conversations like this where we could learn more about the world and expose ourselves to ideas from people like Peter Prigozhin. Wow. Um, I would really love to be quick about this, but this is just so exciting. Um, I really just wanted to express what a privilege it is to be in this room with you all today. Um, I think uh, Professor Brigosian has put his finger on something very important here, and that is uh, what is social justice? It's, a, it's almost a religious movement. We've experienced it. Uh, it, it makes us passionate and, and uh, nervous, uh, anxious. I'm feeling all these things right now because I'm rediscovering uh, myself through the process of uh, talking about it. And so um, I'll talk a little bit first about my, my experience with social justice, just for context, and then I want to try and define it uh, under this lens that, that we've been given. Um, so I think it was uh, a couple years ago now. It was on Facebook. Facebook is poison, for those of you who didn't know. Um, I deleted it for three years so I could leave the technocratic utopia that we're all in, but I rejoined just so I could try and reconnect with people, old threads, old friends. And I commented on something about uh, Colin Kaepernick. It just, I don't know why, I get angry, I want to I want to argue with people. I, I, I want to wrestle with these ideas. Like, why are we kneeling? I just want to watch football. I don't want to be left alone. Um, so I commented. I said, screw it. I hate them. I just want to watch football. And, and they, they pointed at like hordes of people I'd never met before. And these are people from my university out in Wisconsin. They came crashing down on me like I was some kind of tyrant for saying this guy was... A loser. He can't even throw the ball anymore. They don't, they're not playing him as a quarterback because he sucks. And he just wants attention. Is he using it to sell shoes? I don't know. Maybe it's controversial, but still I should be able to say this without being called a Nazi. They were saying I was a Nazi. These are my friends. These are people I care about deeply. I, I just stopped commenting, you know? I don't use Facebook. I don't I don't like social media. I hate it. I, I hate that it's, it's ruled by mob rule. It's, it's, it's ruled by mob justice. And, um, and yeah, I, I have a lot to say, but, but what, is, what is social justice? Social justice is, is the idea that, that I am a racist, that I am a bigot, that I am a homophobe. That is social justice, that when I joke or when I insult someone, that I'm mean, that I'm, that I'm toxic. Um, 
And that's my trigger word, toxic. Say it, say it, say toxic, you know? Like, fight me. I'm, I'm learning to, like, yeah, maybe I am toxic. Maybe I am a terrible person. But, but you should be able to tell me in person, not on the internet. You should be able to look at me and say, hey, you know, we're, we're human, we're, we're people. But the, uh, so, social justice is the internet, it's fake. The internet is fake, and um, that's what social justice is. It's bullshit, so thank you. <laughs> I'm waiting for a white night of social justice to pop up, and it doesn't seem to be happening. Either way, whatever your feelings are, you're, this, is, this is your moment. You're, you're good. Is that it? Is that it? We got, we got everybody? All right. Well, uh, we can transition Hold to on. our... Oh, oh, oh sorry about that. I'm not, I'm not used to getting in front of microphones. I'm not very good at talking, but <laughs> I, I live in a rather poor part of town or at least one with a lot of homeless people. And I've lived there for three years. And I always hear people talk about how they want to help the homeless, but I don't actually see that help. The other day, I was um, about to walk to school to help my friend with um, uh, her math placement test, help her study for that. And I walked past this uh, man who was overdosed next to my apartment. And I, like many others, just kept walking. And then I got about halfway through the bridge, and I'm like, fuck, I need to do something. Sorry. Um, so I stopped, and I didn't know what to do. So first I called 911, uh, the emergency line. I said, gave all my details. But I'm rather calm when I speak on the phone. So I guess they mistook that for not really much of an emergency. And then I went and got the security guard, and he didn't want to help this man either. It took, he did call the non-emergency line after eight minutes. I started my timer when I made that call. After eight minutes, there was no emergency uh, call placed in the uh, system. Uh, they never cared. The, about 22 minutes in, after several people have walked past this man just sitting on the ground, probably close to death, um, a man from D4, a volunteer, which is a recovery system, uh, just happened to be walking by and administered Narcan. And I thought that's strange that he arrived before any emergency services were there. It took emergency services close to 27 minutes to arrive, and they didn't do anything because it had already been done by someone who had stepped up. So I see a lot of people willing to talk about helping, but not a lot of people willing to step up. Since you opened it up to non-PSU students. Um, well, I just wanted to give my two cents. And, you know, I travel. I love to travel on my summers. I'm, I'm a teacher, so I got my summers when I'm lucky. And uh, I've been to, if I were to count, about 20 or so different countries. But I don't spend too much time. I love to get to know the people. I hate, the, I hate seeing the Eiffel Tower, but I love looking at, you know, uh, you know, the person on the street selling uh, little statues of ice little towers, and I love talking with them. And uh, there's some time I, I invested in a school in Nepal, especially this was the most memorable, and I, uh, I went there to check out the investment and to look at the kids and to teach them English, and they wanted to know proper pronunciation, so they had me teach English in classes. And from, that's kind of when it hit me, you know, I've, I look at these people from countries who are you know, seemingly a lot poorer than the U.S. And you know, when I'm talking to them, and uh, I don't consider myself uh, social justice -y at all, to be honest, uh, uh, just because of the uh, bad rap that I feel like it has. But when I talk to them, I feel like I'm like some sort of white knight, some sort of uh, 
like preacher of social justice compared to them. They're uh, people from different countries, especially those who are underprivileged, uh, they don't have the energy. They don't have the, the ability to, to think about everyone. They're too busy thinking about their family, their tuition, and all that stuff. And, and that's when it hit me. I come back to America as actually when you get the social, uh, the, uh, the culture shock is when you come back to the U.S. from another country. Social justice, I feel, is such a privileged idea for privileged people, for people to think about the whole world and think that they can somehow fix other people's problems because you don't have problems of your own. And uh, just it took me uh, that many times of traveling to, to get that sort of uh, epiphany, in my opinion. But I just wanted to share that. I feel that you know, the idea of social justice is, is the definition of privilege right there. Whether it's right or wrong, it's just what it is. Thank you. work, bear with me, is that um, after all of our awesome students and non-students said their piece, uh, we would love to have a sort of panel up front. So I will bring up a few chairs. I'm not pressuring all of you to come up here, but I think it would be great for um, a few of the people who did speak who are interested in sharing a little bit more. Um, we'll just put a couple chairs up here, and then audience members will just ask you questions about your experiences. Um, so. Um, if you're willing, I'm just going to bring a couple chairs up, and I would love to see how you guys can you, you, you can also bring up the So I don't want to ask too many questions so people from the audience can ask questions, but um, if you want to talk about a specific experience that you've had uh, that you didn't share and that you'd like people to know about, we'd, we'd love to hear that. And I also want to know, as a faculty member, what I can do to... Um, because I know what I could do to make your learning experience more meaningful and more substantive, because I know often it's, um, from, from the stories people tell me, it's primarily about social justice and less about content, as we, we heard from math. So I want to know what, what not, not necessarily me in particular, but what the faculty can do better for you, how, how we can better serve your needs. So if you want to do stories, you want to do that, and then I'll open it up to just anything anybody has to say. It seems like a pretty chill group, so just come on up. Thank you. So we can just pass around this microphone to people on the panel. So I'm just going to put you on the spot, and you can start off. Um, th thinking about what faculty can do, uh, I, I guess really ensure that you focus more on your material than any uh, ideological viewpoints you want to impose on your students is the biggest thing I can think about. Um, I'd like to talk about the war on drugs, very briefly. I'm originally from Albuquerque, New Mexico, which is one of the biggest crossroads for drug distribution in the US. And there doesn't seem to be too many resources on this campus specifically for drug abuse issues. It's mostly like just general counseling and general uh, mental health things. And if we could diversify um, faculty, I guess what they could do is they could make more resources available on campus specifically for drug counseling, um, not just drugs in general, but very specific ones. Um, like I'm also a founder of the Psychedelic Club here on campus, and I'd like to see that eventually become possibly a resource center, a psychedelic resource center, because there's a lot of young people late teens, early 20s who are coming onto campus, possibly away from their parents, living away from their parents for the first time, experimenting with these sort of things. 
they're going to experiment with them, whether they're legal or not. And I think there needs to be a safe space to talk about them with other people. And yeah. In the beginning, I had talked about uh, the subjective nature of fe feminism. I completely agree that gender studies, racial studies, feminist studies, all these things are important, but not the way they're being taught today. They're being taught subjectively. They're being taught about how you are still a victim. You were a victim, you are a victim, you will continue to be a victim, and this is why. Nobody can do anything other than, well, teach you that you're powerless and that everybody has to accept you. You don't have to fight for it, you have to be given it. That instead of fighting for respect, you have to demand it. And I think the quickest way to lose a person's respect is to demand for it, or is to demand it. Uh, has anyone here, I'm, I'm sure actually, a lot of us here have uh, done the what's required of all new freshman students, upcoming freshman students to go to an illuminate session. Uh, what were some of your guys' experiences? Because I remember we did this one activity. Uh, I think it was we were supposed to uh, 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 have a response for a bystander. I think it was like bystander training, or that was the intended purpose anyway. But we had. Uh, cards that had scenarios on them that we were supposed to then uh, have some response about what we would do in that situation. I remember one card said that uh, if your roommate or a friend of yours says that they don't support Black Lives Matter, what do you do? And the correct response was to say, you're wrong. You should support Black Lives Matter. And when I pointed out that that was weird, I was actually like shouted down in the Illuminate session. That was that was one. You know, th that's the experience I had. Any, anybody else had an Illuminate? Yeah. Uh, what is Illuminate? I'm a, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a transfer student, so I yeah. never had. I think to it's, do a, it. it's an on group. Uh, it's an on campus group okay, that good. that runs those things. Get the mic real quick, correct? Yeah. I don't, I don't know, know what they are. are. That's that's the one. That's the one thing I did was I went to that thing. It was required of all upcoming freshmen, uh, they also had a card that said um, that your male friend uh, privately has rated uh, the attractiveness of women and, and that, that, that that occurs, you're supposed to, what you're supposed to do is not to be a bystander, right? You're supposed to interject and say, that's wrong, don't do that, or that's sexist. And I don't know, I thought a private conversation between one of your friends, I mean, who's, who's harmed by that? I don't know. Hey, mate, you need a member for the Psychedelic Club? <laughs> um, just, okay, um, just, just a few things. One is, um, to the fishing thing, I work hand in hand with a lot of you know very right leaning people, um, very conservative, and you know as you talk on the boat, you find out where people stand, and um, and you know working with them and seeing how I have to pay taxes, and you know, it it rubbed off on me, and not in any kind of way where now I'm you know voting for Mr. Orange or anything like that, but when that comes into the classroom. And it may not be that issue itself, but in a place of learning, if you don't agree with something and your brain is telling you, like, I don't agree, I don't get it, like, explain it, or like, no, I don't think that. Most of the time, 99% of the time, it's just shut down or it's moved on or you're considered the ostracized member, you know, you got, you pretty much have the coronavirus at that point. Now... I was studying abroad in Scotland the past year, and the same thing is over there. The UK has got a lot of uh, similar problems with the social justice movement that we have here. And that's when I started seeing a lot of Professor Boghossian on YouTube and just watching and watching and just was amazed that this was going on. I, I had an inclination that this was going on at PSU, but to see what happened to him go on, it was like, 
that's that proves my point. Like it makes sense. And then I was really, really excited to take class with them. It was like more than a breath of fresh air that, you know, that it wasn't engaged on such a mandatory biased level. Anyone could talk about anything and, you know, unfortunately no one really was vocal about any opposing views or beliefs, which is, it, it just seems they're pretty shy when it comes to the limelight. They don't have, you know, a hundred backup or you know, their phone in their hands for Twitter. And what it comes down to is like, I, I love heavy metal, I love metal. And so it just makes me so frustrated and angry that this, my education is taking this route that I have, I have a sore neck most days of the week, just the cathartic process of turning my volume all the way up and just head banging, just walking, just to get by day to day from being frustrated from class to class and just seeing this ideology like seep into my own personal education. I don't want that shit. I really don't. I really, I, figure it out for yourself, but don't tell me how to think. Yeah, thanks. Illuminate, I think it's called. Hi, everybody. I'm not sharing my opinion. I'm just saying, um, Illuminate, um, from my understanding, is a sexual violence prevention center at PSU. Um, and it's supposed to be a resource for students who have experienced sexual violence. Um, why they have the bystander training as part of their training session, I, I'm not sure, but um, I do know that that is their main domain, if anyone was curious. Do they walk around in like those little vests? I don't, I think that's the campus safety. Oh, I thought, I thought they mobilized. They're just like preventing violence on the scene, yeah. Prevent this? Well, I have a question for the panel, if that's okay. Um, I am wondering, have you ever felt like you were uncomfortable challenging your professors in class? Um, and if so, what was the topic? Um, and is there a theme of the types of topics that you felt uncomfortable with engaging in um, and providing your own opinion? So I was in a uh, woman in politics class and I agreed with most of the things that the professor would say, you know, I'm, I'm left-leaning, I'm pro-choice, I'm all that, but sometimes she would say things like, Republican women that vote for Trump are, have internalized misogyny. And I, I felt like it was, it was very um, misogynistic to say that about women, that they can't make their own opinions, They're, they have to be internalized or socialized into having their own opinions. And um, I didn't say anything to her. I didn't feel comfortable because that classroom, um, I think there's a lot of peer pressure. Uh, the only person in class that was challenging the professor was a conservative guy. Um, and I thought it was very brave of him, even though I didn't agree with a lot of things that he said. I would roll my eyes a lot. but. I still appreciated it, and one time I went, I went up to him after class, and I told him, "Hey, I appreciate you speaking up and like challenging some of the things that she would say that I don't agree with." And he said, "You know what? You're not the only person that have come up to me." And I thought that was really strange because that means not everyone in class is agreeing, even though no one is saying anything except him. So, last term, I took a. Uh, CS ethics class. <clears throat> and I'm expecting a class on don't use your code maliciously, don't steal people things, people's information, that kind of stuff. It turned into computers are racist and there are not enough women in STEM. Uh, I, I wanted to chime in a few times about how it's it is the sample size for the, the, the facial recognition systems as to why there is an apparent racism, not the, that it's 
overt or anything. But I, I decided to just go with, get the grade. I don't think it's being afraid of your grade not um, uh, that affecting your grade, but it's mostly peer pressure. And whenever someone would challenge, there's a loud minority that would always laugh or look at the person weird. So that's why I also had the impression that everyone else hated this guy. But it was only this three people that would laugh when he would say something. Um, so. I think it's people not knowing that other people also are thinking the same thing. Yeah, I was going to say that it's not being afraid of the professor giving them a bad, bad grade. It's your peers shouting you down and telling you you're wrong and several of them reinforcing that. And, and if you live in, and this is an environment that is fairly left-leaning. I'm pretty left myself. But when I see someone who is not, who's more right-leaning, and they just get shouted down and, you know, told they're wrong, told that they're not allowed to believe this sort of thing, almost. It's, it's, it's counterproductive, and it seems like it's closed-minded, to taking away other perspectives and point of views. So I think it's a bigger issue with peers, put it, peers trying to shout you down rather than the professor giving you a bad grade, in my experience. This happened to me recently. I won't name the class. I won't name names, because snitches get stitches. Uh, and actually, I asked a question because Peter Bogosian's class just gave me the inspiration to. Science is about specificity, and I was learning about visual imagery, imagery and visual discrepancies, so I brought up pronouns, that pronouns, in pronouns, we're trading the specific for the general. And in reading comprehension, when you have such an ambiguous they or this, you're checking yourself before you've had time to actually comprehend the sentence. And uh, my scientific teacher was absolutely not in agreement and spoke to me about the gender fluid spectrum uh, spoke to me about a lot of things that had nothing to do with the subject matter of the class and were really just entirely subjective. I could not follow what she or he was, <laughs> was saying and um, I, want my, I want my diploma. So I shut up about it and didn't really look at anyone else in the class. And um, yeah, I am afraid to voice my opinions. I am afraid that I will not get my diploma and I will have spent $2,000 a class for absolutely nothing. So I don't want to say it's just the way it is because that's a dangerous mindset, but at this moment, that is just the way it is. Uh, I think a lot of us in our lives, uh, we're social people. Uh, we want to have friends. We want to be accepted. Uh, it's very uncomfortable to immediately put yourself at odds with everyone around you and in a stark way. It's clear whenever someone says something that's uh, against the orthodoxy, against what people want them to say, right? It's clear when someone makes a joke that you don't, that the social justice narrative wouldn't approve of and then everyone goes, oh, th that you shouldn't have said that, oh, that's, that's sexist, misogynist, whatever. Uh, so uh, I think I've been lucky in that I haven't really experienced it from faculty. I've felt that I've been able to say uh, things uh, that might they, they, that they themselves might be against. Uh, but I could easily see why other people might feel that they are not able to uh, uh, feel comfortable in expressing themselves when everyone else disagrees with them. That's, that's really what it is. It's, it's a, an environment on this campus where you can't say what you mean if it goes against the orthodoxy, if it is uh, not something that uh, the social justice narrative would accept. If you say that, people will take notice, people will perhaps uh, uh, you know, tell people about what you said, I don't know, but it's, it's not good to be on the, the butt end of that kind of treatment. 
Yeah, following up with pretty much the whole panel, getting the degree is very important. And I've had a situation where I was definitely scared if I said anything, it would affect my grade. And it was that bad of a class. But I've learned how to be a chameleon when I'm sober in this university. But I think it was it was after a concert and I just ended up staying all night, up all night. And I rolled into class, in a, in a frink class that very twisted, still very twisted. And it was a ideological subject that I just was calling bullshit on. And I ended up debating the teacher, arguing with the teacher back and forth. And it wasn't like a, a very spiteful argument, but she was in front of a class and she had to set an example, but I just called her out on any, everything that I thought was just wrong or just misguided or just, you know, chocolate dipped in that social justice frame. And you know, and then uh, like a week later, they had an uh, inquiry panel, and I did the same thing. I was just wondering, and you know, not to be rude or mean, it's just the way, this was Frank, by the way, and I was very concerned that this is going to be my whole grade of peers, that we're learning this, and like no one spoke up, but usually after these outbursts, everyone just, you know, gave me the side eye, or would immediately raise their hand and give you know, some objection. But for that query panel, it was just like, so like, what's going on? I, I have questions. It doesn't make sense. And and now it's it's a lot different because that, that gets even more shade at this point. But you know, I, I did try to stand up. And it was Frank, so I really didn't care. Um, but yeah, at these higher levels, when I'm so close, the finish line is right there. It's really just head down. I'm not willing to risk it. I don't know the extent to which people might actually face physical violence uh, from perhaps Antifa, but that's just something that came to mind. Perhaps people are afraid of that. Could be. I'm, I'm someone who is very willing to be obstinate, and uh, if I think you're wrong, I'll tell you. But when it comes to in class, it, it, it seems an inappropriate time to challenge the instructor on these things. It's just, um, you're the student, they're the instructor. It just seems like that's not the venue for this kind of thing, is really what I, I think. Um, a common theme I've been hearing from the panel is they are afraid to speak out because they want to get the grade and they want to get the grade because they're paying money for school. Um, and I think that the money aspect is creates a sort of power inequity. Like, we're relying on grants. We're relying on scholarships. And if you get a failing grade, your money, your financial assistance is at stake as well. It's not just a grade. It's not just your reputation, it's literally how you're supporting yourself. So I guess this speaks to an even gr bigger problem of, you know, I think, I think school in this country should be free. I think there's enough money at the very, very top, especially for that to happen. Um, and I think that financial, fear of financial retribution or losing financial assistance is a really big part of not being able to speak your mind and challenge professors and wanting to just keep your nose to the grindstone and do the work. Questions pe people in the audience have about their experiences with social justice? Anybody? Okay. Yeah, where's the guy that's hating on Colin Kaepernick? <laughs> Was it you? Do you, so you? You got a lot to talk about, it, right? Why are you hating on Colin Kaepernick? Why? Yeah, why? Why do you not like? You got them to the Super Bowl. When was the last time you got someone to the Super Bowl? No, I'm just kidding. So I think the what I love about Colin Kaepernick, right? Obviously, he uh, he's not the greatest quarterback for sure. Um, 
<laughs> but I love that he sat during the national anthem. So often uh, people think that you have to like have this kind of like, you know, um, respect for patriotism. You have to respect your country. You have to respect the national anthem. Um, and you don't. In fact, like usually the argument is, um, well, you should stand for the national anthem because people die for this country, because people gave up their lives for this country. You know, people gave up their lives for the right for you to choose whether you want to stand or sit during the national anthem. That's the best thing about it. I never stand at the national anthem, and you should neither. And that's what I think is so great about Colin Kaepernick. Yeah, yeah, please. Oh, no, that's okay. Oh, yeah, I don't know where to look. Um, it is an interesting thought, and it's an interesting idea. It's, a, it's good to discuss these things. Um, it's, a, it's a question of ritual. Why are you doing it? Why are you breaking the ritual? They're breaking the tradition. You're breaking the boundaries, right? You're breaking the walls. Now there's no walls between you and the other person. There's no... Uh, distinction between yourself and your peers. You're all equal under one governing body named Facebook. And uh, you know, this, is, this is the end goal of equity. You are all going to be governed by one world government called Facebook. And uh, that's why we're so nice to each other. We have, uh, you know, you, you better be nice or else the eye of Sauron will bear down on you and burn you. Um, but Colin Kaepernick, he was brave in that regard. He did stand out, and he did, uh, he did kneel. But, but what did it lead to? It, it was a kind of division between two sides. And um, people were really upset with each other to a degree that I was disturbed by. Um, and it, it, it kind of revealed the truth, it, is that we are different. And that's... That can be a good thing, um, and it's good to have these discussions. But, but it's the hysteria that that scares me. You know, I, I'd love to talk about Colin Kaepernick all day, um, but um, I don't know. It's weird. It's being twisted for for social media. He became a Nike icon and uh, a feminist icon in some regards. Nike went full social justice. It's like, oh, this is a black issue. This is black and white. No, it's it's something else. There's something else going on. Just just my just my thoughts. Anybody else have any questions? Yeah. Is this a call? <laughs> yeah. No, no. I, I I I have thoughts on that, but I don't want to make it like a personal me and you thing. But well, you know what? I'm I'm already here. Actually, I'm sorry. Uh, Okay, okay, so so in in what in your argument that you made, you said all of the soldiers that fought and died in Iraq fought for this particular reason, which is the only one that I would fight for, which is that specific section of the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, that says we should have these individual liberties. But it's not so one-dimensional like that. The reasons why people are willing to fight and die in the army to to serve whatever it is they think they're serving. For some people, it's God and country overall. People have a sense of nationalism. It's not really common, it's kind of like a bad word on PSU campus, but a lot of people do die for nationalistic reasons. And so I, I just have to say that you're wrong for saying that they die only for this reason that I think they would die for. So that's that. You're welcome to refute that, but you're also welcome to not refute it because like I said, I don't want it to be just me and you. Um, the question that I had for the panel though was, so there, 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 there seems to be this like, trend or tendency of uh, teachers and these people in positions of authority to kind of pass down the social justice narrative to you guys, which is antithetical to the idea of, you know, all of society being this terrible white supremacist capitalist patriarchy that imposes its values upon everybody else. And so if the power structures are feeding you guys the anti, or sorry, feeding you guys the social justice narrative, are there counterexamples? Has anybody experienced an anti-social justice narrative being propagated by the authorities in school, which is the teachers? And if so, would you share about it? I mean, Bogosian excluded. <laughs> Very rarely do I ever actually see uh, any professors that are anti-social justice. And the 
very few times I have is when I go into office hours with my professors. Um, and most of the time, I'll just go and talk to them about curriculum, and then the conversation will wander. Um, but at those points, they'll start opening up more to me when I welcome like this anti-social justice opinions that they're expressing. Then they really start to open up and like reveal their true colors or whatever. Um, that they also think that it's not correct or that I, like they'll just agree with me in that sense. Um, but then it, like there's a subtext underneath that that they're not saying it in class because they will get fired or they'll lose tenure, et cetera, et cetera, if they do the same. So I think that they're in a very similar position as students are in that we're afraid we won't get our degree, but they're afraid that they will no longer have their faculty position if they review these same things. So I think that it's bigger than just our faculty. I think it's the institution itself. I think it might even be beyond the institution. Um, those are my thoughts on that. I was actually speaking with a former PSU student earlier today about professors and their tenure and how they have to be, it, to, have, to get their tenure, they not only have to be professors, but they have to be the head of social clubs and they have to, you know, if they're in a science department, they have to have, if they, it's good to have, for them to have something published. And so they're focusing on other things rather than just teaching. And they're afraid of their tenure, which is, or losing their tenure, which also leads to finance, the issue of financial insecurity and afraid to lose their money and their job. And I think that when everyone is worried about money and afraid about money, it's easier to pit them against each other on issues that don't, that aren't quite as black and white. Like wealth inequality is pretty black and white in this country between the top 1% and the bottom 99%, you know? And I think issues like race, gender, pronouns, they're not, I'm not saying they're not important issues, but they're, they're kind of distracting beside the point. Can I uh, piggyback off of this question and ask you, the panel, or I appreciate you, uh, God, what the half there. Uh, we need to use the mic. Yeah, we need to use the mic. Yeah, we're, we're the mic. yeah uh, so I, I, I thought that was a really interesting question. Um, so, and I thought that was a really interesting response. So I'm just curious, is anybody, when you go to your professor's office hour, um, have they done, have they done something like that? Have they opened up to you and said, you know, look, I'm just, I'm not sure I'm comfortable with this. And then only if you want, if you, without mentioning names, if you would relay what you told me, that would be great. But if not, that's a hundred percent fine too, without mentioning any names. So I'm curious if that's been an experience with anybody. Only if you want. I I don't have any particular examples. Uh, um, yeah, my uh, m uh, marketing professor, uh, he's from, uh, originally from, I believe. No names, no names, no people. Yeah. Okay, okay, all right, okay, okay. We don't want to Okay. Well, he was just like, yeah, uh, this is a way different, like, culture here, and like, he, he said the word soft, and, was, and like, um, and but it was just between me and him, though, and uh, he's a good friend, too, so, I mean, it was just, like, I didn't, I, yeah, that was it, but I thought that was pretty interesting. That was, like, the only experience I've ever had like that, though. And picking back to his, his question, have you found anybody to give a counter-narrative to the social justice, like, <clears throat> to any of the, you know, to act like we should have equality and not equity, or we need intellectual diversity, or someone's sexual orientation really shouldn't matter. Like, have you heard any of that stuff? Uh, not any of that stuff in particular, no. Um, yeah, sorry. I also did have a question, though. Um, what is, uh, I guess this could be for anyone, but uh, what do you think about the uh, university studies courses uh, at PSU? Uh, like I personally just don't like how I can't. There's, those credits are non-transferable, so I was gonna leave PSU, but I, it was gonna add an extra year of school, so I did not. Let's keep it to social justice. Okay. Right? Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Okay. I got well, okay. For sure. I'll just leave this up here then. Oh. 
Well, I didn't have anything to say. But no, not on this campus, uh, not behind closed doors, um, and not in front of a class. And I know there's that pressure, as mentioned before, to be in front of a class and where there are so many ways that it could come back and bite them, or anyone for that matter. Um, no, I haven't. If, if anyone has, you know, that's great, please. But I also wonder if I have, if it's just been buried and repressed over all the SJW stuff that is 99% of the experience. So maybe in there, but I can't remember right now. Does any, anybody want to share? Just on the question of whether we had a teacher who Oh yeah, asked, off of his question. Which was? Have you had a teacher ever spout down to you an anti-social justice narrative? I mean, I wouldn't say that it was anti-social justice. Can we get the mic to him? But I, okay, I'll get the mic to him. <coughs> I, um, not, I wouldn't say that they were anti-social justice, but I would say that I've had teachers who were kind of in line with your uh, way of thinking. And I've had instances where, you know, I've had an essay where I, I've taken your class before and I said something, um, that you said in your class, which was basically, you know, uh, the importance of, you know, diversity of ideas and everything. And it was underlined, and it said, nice, explanation point, totally agreed with me. And so I've actually had at least, yeah, a handful of teachers who I think would agree with a lot of what you say. And I, I find it interesting that it seems that there is a handful of students who seem to have no experience with that. But I don't really have anything to say which, on that. Which is that? Oh, you mean that they've never encountered that? Yeah. yeah. Do Do you think it is at all an atmosphere of fear? What like, is? Well, like when people will come up to me, for example, and they'll say, "Oh, great job, great job," mm -hmm. and they'll whisper it, right. and they'll lean into me. I mean, do do you, there must be a reason that they're not speaking like I'm speaking to you? Hey, how's it going? There must be a reason that they're whispering that. I, I wouldn't know. I mean, that's their own personal experience, yeah. That's just all I had to say. I, I have had experiences with teachers who, I, and I wouldn't say that it was anti-social justice, but I would just say that they were open-minded. Yeah. So um, at the start of the panel session, you said that you generally agree that subjects like race and gender studies and feminist studies are important, but you think that they're being taught subjectively. What would, from your perspective, a truly objective approach to these subjects look like? That's a really good question. And honestly, when I think about it, I'm having trouble even thinking of an answer. And makes me wonder if what I said was just a way to be a little bit politically correct by saying they do super matter. You know, They just have to be taught objectively. It was sort of my way of saying, they do matter. I just, I don't know how to really approach it because it's always, it seems like it has started out subjectively. It started out as a victim thing, as a, I've never seen it any other way or been taught it any other way. So it's difficult for me to answer that a little bit because I just don't know what an alternative would look like. So. <laughs> Um, in our entitled society, I think they matter. In less entitled or less, someone mentioned earlier he, traveling to countries, countries I assume more in the global south, not in the global north, like Nepal is one you mentioned, countries where people are a lot poorer, they get, they're paid lower wages. These issues don't matter so much to people there is what I've sort of learned, because they're so focused on just surviving and getting by day to day. But since we don't have to worry about that, we don't have to you know, fetch our own clean water or chop our own firewood, and human beings are sort of combative. We want to, we want to argue with people. There's a part of human beings that want conflict and that seek out argument. And so I think it's really easy for our leaders and politicians to manipulate us with 
issues of race versus race, cops versus Black Lives Matter, um, you know, gender pronouns versus, you know, that sort of thing doesn't matter. And I think that, I think, I think the quote, social justice is entitlement was really accurate, but it's also, it gives us a responsibility not just other people in this country, but to the entire world, particularly people in the global south who have to deal with the financial implications of being, of the current capitalistic global economic system of the global north imposed on them. So I think when we have more time to think and more time to explore our own ideas is when we get to these like, does it matter, does it really matter? And to survive, it doesn't matter. But to just go along with our everyday lives, it matters more to some than others, I think. We have uh, the room for 15 more minutes. So if anybody wants to uh, ask another question about social justice or if you'd like to make a statement uh, about your experiences, uh, either tonight or in general at Portland State as it relates to social justice, uh, this is the time in the, the remaining minutes that we have Um, if we grant that at any course in his at any point in history, uh, race has been used to uh, uh, genocidal proportions, which it has. If we grant that gender has been used, uh, or along the lines of gender, oppression has existed, which it has, then it might well be uh, a good thing or a useful thing to study these things to understand how oppression along the lines of gender or race has occurred, to understand how to better make it so that gender and race is no longer a tool of oppression or a method by which oppression or inequality lies. Uh, I'm not sure whether or not these f fields of study are doing th those things, but that perhaps would then be uh, an answer to what would a gender studies that is objective look like? A uh, gender studies that seeks to undo or understand uh, patterns of society along gender. I think that's totally legit, actually, potentially. I don't know how many of you have heard the term that is used, uh, a race racism, and I find it that the way they say it, it's very counterintuitive because they're just embracing it and just rubbing it in everyone's face to sh show examples of it. But if if we were to, you know, advance as society and where everyone got along, I would actually not want to erase racism and act, have it be objective examples in history where it has occurred so you, you can be aware of it, so people can learn about it. Um, and But again, from an objective point of uh, objective teachings, not, um, you know, in a world where everyone just forgot that terrible things happen, because it is good to remember bad things so you can really appreciate the good things. Sure. Uh, so, you know, I, I actually thought when I first saw the flyer, I would, uh, share an experience, uh, and the more I, I got to thinking about it, I found that I was going to start that experience with as a student. And uh, the phrase I found bothersome the more I gave it some consideration because it was going to relate to as a student, how do I think about social justice? As a student, how has academia sort of intermeshed with my understanding of social justice? And as I was going through this process and sort of thinking about it, I realized that the statement as a student is incredibly esoteric. It wouldn't really do uh, all that much justice, ironically enough, to a statement of social justice. Um, equally as important, it seemed somewhat concerning to me that in describing the process, uh, I was in fact imbricating these two notions, this notion of academia and how I, as a student, experienced social justice. 
And I admit the, pr the problem here that, that I at least have, rather than describing to you my experience, is stating that as a person who's very committed to academia, as a person who is very committed to academia, uh, I find it bothersome that notions of social justice, notions of politics in general, have infiltrated their way into an understanding of what it means to be a student. A student as a sort of academic character seems to be one that, yes, while has had some engagement with political discussion and has been engaged in elements of politics historically, is also someone that is focused on study, focused on research, focused on the projects of working through and developing, cultivating certain types of skills and knowledge. So in stating that how, does, how has social justice affected me or you as a student seems to import a certain type of concept that is not necessarily endemic to being a student. And it's, it's in light of that, that that I think my sort of bullet point with all of this is that there's a monumental effort uh, as we go about our collective lives as students, those of you in this room who are, uh, and a process of sort of inculcating a type of political knowledge with that studentness, with our studenthood. And it's bothersome. It's bothersome in some way that when left to its own devices, we don't simply get to be students. We have to be students enmeshed in social justice, students enmeshed in types of political ideas, students enmeshed in types of things that are not necessarily research, study, the process of being a student. Yeah. I would absolutely refute the notion that um, I guess what we would call the modern social justice movement has enmeshed politics in the student and student life because the Vietnam War protests were an absolutely massive political student movement that existed before the modern social justice movement. So I don't think it's at all fair to say that the enmeshment that you speak of stems from social justice in any meaningful way. Absolutely, as I said, historically, right? So historically, that's absolutely true. That's why I mentioned from the historical notion, right, that the notion of a political student and someone engaged in politics, that is not a new concept at all, at all. I completely agree. From a historical perspective, we have evidence going back to, what, one of the oldest schools in Europe is Leuven, right, in Belgium. They've had a tradition of being engaged in some way with political discussions, right? Those types of things happen, right? So there's, there, is a, there is a substantial difference, though, between, say, William of Ockham having a discussion about the notion of God from a scholastic standpoint in the 12th century, and you and I walking through our lives as students and having this clear-headed notion of social justice that we have to engage with, not just with the context of our classes, but with the context of our administration, with the context of our faculty, right? So there's this big difference between engagements that you and I might have that are external to the process of being a student and the actual engagement of a student with research or being a student. You see what I'm saying? I see what you're saying, but I'm not sure that I agree that that's in any way a recent process. Right, okay, that's fair, that's fair. Do you, did you want to? So a lot of you, to kind of jump on this, a lot of you have said that you're scared that your grades may be affected or that your grants may be taken away from you if you disagree with what your professors are saying. Um, it kind of went back and forth. Some people at first said no, then some people said yes. Uh, and I'm just wondering why you feel that way and if anybody's grades have been affected or people's grants have been taken away. Um, you know, if there's any, to pull something from Peter that I learned, like what's your evidence for that? Like. What, what makes you think that could happen, or has it happened? Maybe it has, I don't know. Um, do, do any of you think that that has happened, or could happen? Why do you, why do you fear for your grants and your grades? Just that kind of, that's my question. From speaking out in class? Yeah, from speaking out in class, right. So if you're in a class with a professor, and a professor says something that you disagree with, um, I went to college a long time ago, but I would certainly be encouraged to d disagree with them, and I had never thought that it would affect my grade or I would lose my grants or anything like that. So I just, I, I would love to get into that a little bit. And yeah. I, 
I, I kind of hijacked no, that no. a little. Okay. okay. You um, were you're being grand, and I just no, I wanted no, to no, pull it back. No, no, that's that's applicable, and maybe this will maybe this will help clarify. Um, so as I said, I'll, I'll try I'll try and avoid sharing details, but uh, you know, I have been engaged in an academic level, certainly at Portland State, for some time, and one of the issues that has occurred just over my tenure here has been uh, instances where students have specific ideas and those ideas when coming into conflict with new ideas take on a political character, not a discussant character, not a character that's specifically research oriented, not a character as you're describing, which might simply be a conversation that might not have an impact on grades, but simply an academic discussion. It's that type of thing that has changed. And as I said, in my tenure here, I have engaged in these types of things which really do have real world consequences. Can you, can you only at your comfort level sure. and not be on your comfort level? Right. You have a very interesting story that speaks directly to his point to the extent that you're comfortable sure. sharing sure. that. Maintaining a degree of anonymity, I guess, uh, with respect to the other parties involved. But yeah, I mean, to, to be specific, you know, I uh, had taught a class. I had had uh, several students in the class as we are engaging in this process, and I'm uh, pitching out ideas ranging from ideas which would be relatively mainstream to ideas that aren't for the purposes of facilitating a discussion. And as I'm engaging in this process, I have uh, students who grow upset. They don't like the ideas. They don't like what's being portrayed. Irrespective of my position on them, it's the presentation of them that became problematic. And suddenly those, those presentations were less about the content and became targeted at me, a person teaching a course, right? And so suddenly it's not even about whether you like the book or whether you agree with the author that I'm writing up on the board, right? Irrespective of whether I do or not, right? It becomes less about that, and then it suddenly became more so about me. And now the accusations came out. You remind me of an abusive ex-boyfriend because of the way you talk. You, based on the way you're dressed, remind me of someone I might see at a march you remind me of X, Y, and Z, right? Now again, this happens in a very short span of time. Discussing an idea very quickly leads to a personal attack. And that personal attack is, is based on how I'm dressed. I know what, I wear. What happened to you then? Yes, so suddenly I'm engaged in administrative stuff. And this does, this does actually speak to it. Consequences ensue. And in this case, there were real academic consequences to this. I was then embroiled in discussions with administration. I'm embroiled in conversations with people who directly affect my employment, my pay. I'm having to engage with attorneys because suddenly I'm subject to accusations that I have no defense over whatsoever. And even though I'm stating repeatedly, I'm merely an instructor, I'm simply providing ideas they're not even mine, they're through books, they're through literature, they're through people who I admit I don't state whether I agree with or not because it's not my personal position to take on an author. I let the students interpret. But real world consequences ensued and I had to spend months and months and months engaged in hearing after hearing after hearing to the point where attorneys were involved, to the point where I have paperwork involved from HR, departments I've never even heard of are suddenly involved, right? And after all of this process, all of this process, while ultimately it, it ended up, ended up uh, causing me significant amount of uh, time and money and effort, you know, all it ended up being was a way to say, why aren't you agreeing with us on this? And if you're not willing to teach this specific course in the way we want, we're not going to give it to you again. And as a direct result, other courses are fine, but not this one, because we have a specific objective that we want you to teach. And engaging with those types of authors, asking people to 
take a look at a specific type of uh, uh, body of work is objectionable and ultimately not something that should be permitted in an academic classroom. So that's what I mean by the politicization of something, right? The infiltration of something that should be fundamentally research-oriented and academic has now become subject to the political and it does have real-term consequences. In this case, a, remo a, a, a barring from a class that I will never be able to teach again at Portland State, you know? Access to, access to students who genuinely enjoyed me, who were, who were learning and engaging and having uh, interesting discussions. And many students did come forward and say, hey, we were enjoying this. I had them as witnesses, student after student, said, hey, that's not the case. But it didn't matter. It didn't matter to administration, right? Because these political effects have very serious implications on the broader structure of academia, not the academics itself. That's my point. We, we are almost, we're almost, uh, thank you. I, my, I appreciate that, and maybe if you want to connect with him later, you, if you, oh, yeah. yeah. Um, so we're, we only have the room until uh, 8.30, or 7.30, right? Yeah, 7.30, 7.31. Now, I, I think we could probably go a few, few minutes over if anybody would like to, to, to make a, a comment uh, or a final comment. I, I'd just like to say thank you so much, everyone, for sharing, and I'm pretty amazed at the civility here this evening. I appreciate it. Yeah, would you like to make a comment? I, uh, I just have one, one comment. Uh, right now, I'm reading uh, The Righteous Mind by Jonathan Haidt. It's on the psychology of morals. Uh, in there, he, he drops a little bit about uh, the best way to combat racism is through group bonding. So uh, basically telling everyone that they're just a bunch of bags of meat is a much better way of fighting racism than dividing everyone by race that social justice warriors do. Uh, it's a response to your question. Um, it, when it, I had a paper on something that was, I found pretty objective in history and the way I went about it, you know, there was, I think it was colonialism. So the, the class had a lot of uh, leaning towards oppression and genocide and whatnot, but I also wrote about uh, the benefits of that helped pull Europe uh, ahead and, you know, develop it into out of the dark ages into the Renaissance. And when I got it back, uh, it said it, it was a lower grade. It was it was a fine paper, but the specific comment was, yes, but you didn't speak enough to the pain and uh, what the you know natives went through. And to that point, it at that moment it was kind of clicked in my head. It's like now I will never be able to engage with this objectively for a good grade. And and maybe maybe that was just an ultimatum I made so I could get through it. But if the what I found, what I took from it is like, if the professor is not willing to, um, or it, it will always be sort of one-sided, then in order to get through my education, I will have to continue to write to please them for the grade. So I will never be able to, maybe on my own time, but within the academic sphere, within school, I will never be able to access it and have that conversation and have that um, or write about it in a creative or expressive way that helps me learn in my own you know cognitive functioning because I'll have to always tailor it to what they want does that make sense yeah, yeah. all right All right, so we'll do those three comments and then we'll wrap up. And don't feel rude if you have to leave for something right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, so this, this was just like in regards to your question on like what would an objective gender studies curriculum look like? I think it was you that asked the question, sorry, bad memory. Um, and, 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 and also addresses your notion of the subjectivity as being the major problem within it. I don't think the difficulty is so much the objectivity versus subjectivity of the subjects, it's just their pervasiveness 
in the culture that we live in. And so if there was an entire college, an entire college building dedicated toward Armenian genocide studies, and where you had to constantly focus on the victims of the Armenian genocide again and again, year after year, same thing. You can present nothing but objective facts, but the end result would end up being that everybody would hate Turks or something like that. And that's, uh, that's not good. So just having objective facts, the frequency with which they're laid out and on what topic these objective facts are laid out is going to have a disproportional effect and promote a specific narrative. And that's kind of what I see walking around campus. You see a lot of posters all on the wall every day. There's a new email from Global Gender Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, whatever office saying that there's a new event promoting people of color in this thing, a new event promoting women in this specific thing. Again and again, diversity and equity uh, ad nauseum. And, and so even if there are specific like objective statistics and whatever pertaining to that, if that's the only thing that's presented, it does push a narrative. And so, yeah, the notion of subjectivity versus objectivity being the issue doesn't really, doesn't really jive. It doesn't seem to matter as much as that frequency. So, yeah. Yeah. You raise an entirely like, great point, great point, which made me rethink what what I mean when I say subjectivity and objectivity. And what I guess I mean is, and this is going to sound awful, but I want a solid answer on why this all matters. Like There are lots of different reasons people give me, some emotionally based, some rationally based, but but no one seems to have a clear idea on why any of these things matter and what what the point of them for the future is, I guess. <laughs> um, just a quick few final thoughts. We're all human. We're all imperfect. We all have our own biases, our own different narratives, and our own different shared experiences. So I don't think anything we can't say can be objective. And I think we should just know that Everything has a point of view. Everything has a bit of bias to it. And just try and navigate those biases and point of views when we learn from it. Well, thank you, everybody, so much. This has been an awesome discussion. I'm glad that we ran over time. That means that we're engaged and this is important. So. Um, if you are interested in engaging with our student group anymore, please come up to one of us in one of these sweatshirts and we will get you signed up for the email list. Um, and yeah, just thanks again and have a great rest of your evening. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. How did this event go, do you think? I think it went really well. Um, initially, I think it was a little bit awkward because especially with the subject, people are just a little bit afraid to put a name to the ideas and speak up, but I think once people set the example and saw that uh, people were comfortable talking about it and it's not the boogeyman and it's okay to say that you're uncomfortable with social justice or that it's, you are comfortable with it, um, it's just a step in the right direction. So um, I'm, I'm happy about that. Hi. <laughs> um, I'm happy that that went well. Ideally, I kind of wish that there was somebody who was super pro-social justice on the panel. Um, so I was a little disappointed that I didn't see that. But overall, I was glad that it was a civil discussion and that people had a great time. Nice. Why, why is that important? Well, it's important to have a civil discussion because or else you will literally not have a discussion. And that's <laughs> happened with our events in the past where, uh, you know, Peter's tried to say something or we invited a speaker to campus and then suddenly their ability to share their ideas with people who want to hear the ideas is just completely thrown out the window. So that's the importance of a civil discussion. For these discussions in general, I mean, you can see in there the students are craving something like this just to be able to be comfortable um, with sharing these ideas and meeting people who share the ideas. I mean, if you look around, people are making friendships right now. Um, and so that right there, I think, is all the evidence you need. Do you think uh, things like this are important for the students, for students? Vital, level? yeah, indispensable. It really was a good event. People were very honest and they were very open and sincere and nobody was jeering or sneering or mocking or screaming or protesting or freaking out or going berserk or calling everybody a Nazi. So it was really a, uh, I think it was a good event where people could be honest with each other and engage each other and uh, 
and I I enjoyed it, and a lot of people subsequently told me they enjoyed it. So maybe someone else will pick this up, and and my, my hope is that the faculty and the administration will listen to this because people are concerned. And the fact of the matter is that this is an ideology, and there's simply no evidence for this. At some point, we will look back five, ten, fifteen years, and we will say to ourselves, "Wow, like we fell for this hook, line, and sinker," and. We should take some measures to make sure we don't fall for the next moral fad. Yeah.